Specification standards for fasteners specify the strength of bolts and other threaded fasteners with the minimum proof load, which is the maximum load that a bolt can withstand without acquiring a permanent set, and the proof strength, which is the quotient of the proof load over the tensile stress area AT, which we talked about and mentioned in the member stiffness video, link below. Although good quality bolts can be preloaded into the plastic range, depending on the application, you'll want non-permanent connections to be able to reuse fasteners or cost yielding for permanent connections when you don't expect to reuse fasteners. The proof strength roughly corresponds to one ten thousandth of an inch permanent set in the fastener, which is the first measurable deviation from elastic behavior. If we look at a stress strain diagram for bolt materials, we would see that there is no clearly defined yield point, and that it curves smoothly up to the point where we see fracture, in other words, tensile strength. The yield strength would still be defined using the 0.2% strain permanent set definition, and we would see the proof strength below that. Finding mean values for proof load and proof strength is an experimental process, usually in a testing lab, and that is up to the designer. But fortunately, values for minimum proof load and minimum proof strength can be found online or in your textbook, since they are part of specification codes. A good approximation for when you can't find the value for your material, which is not very often, is 85% of the yield strength. It is commonly recommended to use a preload of 75% of the proof load for a non-permanent connection, that is if you want to reuse fasteners, or 90% of the proof load for permanent connections. The main reason for this is that since the friction is what's holding everything together, and because of stress relaxation, the stresses and therefore the forces will go down over time, you usually want to be as close to the proof strength as possible. This already suggests that the factors of safety will be close to 1. The tensile stress in the bolt can be found by dividing the bolt tension FB over the tensile stress area AT. Since the bolt tension FB is equal to the fraction of the external load that goes into the bolt, which is the fraction of the external load that does not go into the members, plus the preload FI, and PV is equal to CP, with C being the stiffness constant of the joint, which we had derived a couple videos ago, the stress will basically have two components, one from the external load and one from the preload. If we were comparing this tensile stress to the proof strength, we can see how a statement like the one from the example of the previous video, link below, can be made, where we were given that the weight of the fan, which is the external load, caused 30% of the maximum allowable tensile load within the bolt. To get to that statement, as someone designing the assembly of your parts, you could use the weight of the fan, split it into four, since we were using four bolts, find the fraction of that load that goes into the bolt PB by using the member stiffness and bolt stiffness values, and divide by the tensile stress area. If the value you obtain from this is, for example, 30% of the proof strength, you can state, just like during that example, that the weight is generating tension inside the bolt that is equal to 30% of the maximum allowable tensile load, which we now know we can call the proof load. And that's how you would get to a statement like that. Technically, the preload could generate the other 70%, but then that would mean that the factor of safety is exactly 1. In general, the yielding factor of safety would be defined as SP over sigma B, or by substituting what we just defined as sigma B, the factor of safety can be written as SP AT over CP plus FI. Since it's common to load a bolt close to the proof strength, this value will in fact be close to 1. The second indicator for a factor of safety is the load factor, which is applied to the external load P only, meaning it's guarding the bolt against overloading. Applying the load factor NL to the load only, meaning the load is no longer just P, but NL times P, we can assume that sigma B is equal to a proof strength with that load factor already in it, and solve for the load factor NL. Finally, the third indicator is specific to a case where the external load would cause the joint to separate. We'll call this the external load p naught. If separation does occur, then all of the external load p naught goes into the bolt, which means that Fm, the member tension, is zero. With Fm equal to zero, and recalling from the member stiffness video that Fm, the tension inside the member, is the result of Pm, the fraction of the external load that goes into the members, minus the preload, we can say that 1 minus C times P0 minus Fi is 0. The factor of safety against joint separation, N0, would be P0 over P, 
which means p naught is n naught times p. And by substituting in the expression on the bottom right, n naught would be equal to the preload over 1 minus c times p. Let's see how this is all used with a simple example, including concepts from the bolt stiffness and member stiffness video forward. In a theme park, I'm looking to hang a big, heavy screen from a cast iron beam in the ceiling. The thickness of the beam is 3 fourths of an inch, and the stand that the screen is connected to has a base that is also 3 fourths of an inch thick. I have some 3 eighths of an inch 16 grade 5 steel bolts, and I want to know how many of those I need to use to bolt the screen to the ceiling. I know that the weight of this very heavy screen is 12 kips. So I would like to use a load factor of 2 to find the number of bolts I require. After selecting the number of bolts that I need, I would like to report the yielding factor of safety, the actual load factor for that number of screws, and the factor of safety against joint separation. We will not solve it here, but you can imagine that the other thing that I can find out here is the recommended torque you would use to tighten these bolts. I know that the load factor 2 is what's going to determine how many bolts I'm going to be using. And I know that in this case, each bolt will be subjected to a load of P over the number of bolts. So I can find an expression for the load factor in terms of the number of bolts N and solve for that number of bolts N. Let's take a look at these variables. I know that the load factor I'm using is 2 that the stiffness constant of the joint C can be found if I know the bolt stiffness and the member stiffness. The total load is the 12 kips from what I'm hanging from the ceiling. The proof strength will be that of the bolts, which if they are made of grade 5 steel, I can look up and find that it's 80 KSI. The tensile stress area, AT, can be found if I look up the dimensions of the bolt. I know that AT is equal to PD squared over 4 for a mean diameter between the root diameter and the pitch diameter. But since we've done that process before, I will use a table in a textbook that already gives me what the tensile stress area is for my 3 8 inch 16 bolt. And finally, for the preload FI, I would like to be able to reuse the bolt and nut. Therefore, I'm gonna go with the recommended values for the preload and subject it to 75% of the proof load, which would be equal to 0.75 times the proof strength times the tensile stress area, following that stress is force over area, and therefore force is equal to stress times area. What this means is that the problem of finding the number of bolts comes down to calculating the stiffness constant of the joint C, which means we need to calculate the bolt stiffness and the member stiffness constants, KB and KM. From the expression we derived during the bolt stiffness and the member stiffness video, link below, we know we will need the length of the threaded portion of the grip and the length of the unthreaded portion of the grip, as well as the major diameter area of the fastener. If I look up my 3 8 of an inch 16 grade 5 steel bolt on McMaster, and since the thickness of both members, which is the grip L, is 1.5 inches, 3 fourths of an inch from each, I'm gonna assume that a length of 2 inches is enough. Here I can see that the threaded length LT is equal to 1 inch, and by looking at the height of the nut, which is close to the height of the head of the bolt, means that the bolt works. By works, we mean that the length of the bolt we chose is longer than the thickness of the members or the grip L of 1.5 inches plus the height of the nut, so the nut will be fully engaged. From this diagram, I can find that the length of the threaded portion within the grip is 0.5 and the non-threaded length is 1 inch. The area of the non-threaded portion would be that of a circle using the nominal diameter. And since I already know what the tensile stress area is and what the elastic modulus of the steel is, the bolt stiffness would be equal to 1.934 megapounds per inch. Now all I need is the member stiffness. Going back to the equation we derived during that video again, we can substantially simplify it based on the information we know from the members. We know that they're both 3 fourths of an inch thick and that they're both made of cast iron, which means the elastic modulus is going to be the same for both. Because of their thickness, the thrust drum would be in the middle, and K1 and K2 would be the same. This means that the member stiffness, which is found by adding them in series, would be equal to half of what the expression gives us. Additionally, since we're not using washers, capital D would be the outer diameter of the face that makes contact between the nut and the members, or the bolt head and the members. 
From a previous video, we had established that this outer diameter is 1.5 times the nominal diameter. If we substitute this capital D value into the equation for the member stiffness and realize that the thickness of each member is the grip over 2, we obtain a very simplified expression. With the elastic modulus of cast iron and the grip and the nominal diameter, I would find that the member stiffness is 5.21 megapounds per inch. And this is all we needed, because with this value, we can go back to find the stiffness constant of the joint, and with it, solve for the number of bolts. If I use 4 bolts, the load factor will not be 2, and therefore, I have to round up. Now that I have the number of bolts, I can go back to calculating the three factors of safety indicators. The yielding factor of safety, the actual load factor with the actual number of bolts, and the factor of safety against joint separation. The yielding factor of safety will be that with a load of 12 over 5 kips, since the 12 kips will be distributed into 5 bolts. A value close to 1 suggests that both the load factor equal to 2 was a good idea and that assuming a preload of 75% the proof load for a non-permanent fastener worked pretty well. The new load factor with 5 bolts would be equal to 2.38 which works well since my requirement was for it to be 2. If I had chosen 4 bolts instead of 5, since 4.19 bolts was closer to 4, the load factor would have resulted in a value lower than 2, which would not be acceptable. And finally, for the factor of safety against joint separation, I find a value of 2.65, which tells me that a preload of 75%, the proof load, and an external load of 12 kips over 5 will not make the members separate. Now, I mentioned one more question that I said we wouldn't solve today. I know that my bolts will work, and that if I use 5 of them, all the factors of safety will be over 1. This is all as long as the preload is exactly 75% of the proof load. To get there, I would probably like to know the torque required to generate that preload. To do that, we would just use the torque to load relationship we've used in the past. Or to make calculations easier, we could use the version of the expression that uses the torque coefficient capital K, which if you notice the bolt that I selected would take a value of 0.2, since we have a zinc plated bolt. With everything we've covered so far with respect to fasteners, together with what we've learned about fatigue and what you've learned during your mechanics of materials course, like bearing stresses or basic pure shear stresses, you would be able to develop relationships on your own for things like shear stresses and dynamic loading applications related to fatigue for fasteners. On your own, or at least easily understand what the textbook has to offer regarding those subsections. After covering topics related to springs, gears, bearings, and other components, we will come back to fasteners and solve design scenarios which include fatigue and a combination of stresses other than just tension. Link below. In the next video, we will transition to spring-related topics. We will start with stresses within a spring and spring constant equations, which will allow us to perform basic spring design processes. Thanks for watching.